Right, so here we are back again on the remote terminal. Uh, I've just logged in again. So let's go back to sources in the LFS and carry on with the next part. Um, it does say about possibly getting a warning next time about the um, fastest not unmounted cleaning. I didn't get that and I wouldn't expect to get it because it is set set to read only so um, you shouldn't get any problems with that so installing the kernel um, okay again I should get these things downloaded really um, so some information about getting the kernel but it's probably not appropriate anymore uh, it's probably remove it remove um, just ignore that um, a lot of the time mirrors are selected automatically now when you go to download a file uh, unless it explicitly says otherwise so let's uh, fetch that let's run this again So I downloaded a more recent one, as I remember. There it is. There, yeah, 2.2.13. So we're on, I think, 2.2.7 with SUSE 6.1. So it's um, quite a bit newer. Let's download that. Save it, press enter, and that's done. So now we need to unpack it. So once again, Zcat Linux and put it through tar. Now, this Linux is so old, it's extremely simple to set up. It's um, it's not like modern, modern kernels where there are depths and depths and numerous number of options to configure and set um, so it's fairly straightforward to go through and set up and get a working kernel so let's change into it that does actually mention there but let's do make MR proper to clean the output directory and then do make menu config to get a menu up so all I'm going to do now is to go through each of these options it looks like there's still a lot to get through but there isn't believe me the, the levels of the menus only go down you know maybe one or two levels and there aren't many, many options to go through anyway. So let's start at the top. That's asking basically for experimental code. So we don't want that. So we'll leave it unchecked. You might need to select that if you're desperate to get something to work, a bit of hardware that's uh, in an experimental stage. Process type and features. Well, it defaults to Pentium Pro, which is what you'd want for a Pentium 2. And as I say, I'm not sure if Pentium 3 was around 
at this sort of time, but it would suffice anyway. Um, the one I need is this one here. If you're unsure, do help, and it explains exactly what you need here. So as you can see, Pentium, which is what I've selected for the Pentium and Pentium MMX. Uh, 586 is just for generic Pentium CPUs lacking the TSC register, which is basically all the AMD um, CPUs, I think. Oh, apart from the K5, K6, and K6-3D. Oh, and it does mention Pentium 2, though, actually, for the Pentium Pro. So it looks like the Pentium 3 wasn't around at this time. And as it says there also at the bottom, if you're unsure, the safest bet is just to select 386, and it'll still work. Maximum memory, the option's got 1 gig, 2 gig. Well, I've got only got 64 megs, so 1 gig is fine. Math emulation, if you're building on a 486SX, something which hasn't got a coprocessor in, you'll need to check that because the kernel won't boot without it. Um, MTRR, I think this is just for Pentium Pros onwards. Yep, and some Cyrix and AMD chips. Um, so I don't need that. Symmetric multiprocessing, or unless you have got a dual Pentium Pro or something similar, uh, just uncheck that. It's going to be redundant loadable module now in the book it does mention not to configure anything as modules at this point and that's because we want a monolithic kernel um, we don't want it to rely on the file system we just want it to load and load everything all in one go so I want to make sure that that is oops that's unchecked general setup networking support we want PCI support obviously you haven't got we've got an old machine without PCI you'll need to take that out MCA if you've got that uh, basically left all of these uh, parallel support uh, I can't imagine you'd need that that might be useful um, in fact you'll probably need that to do this power off and shut down Um, currently, the kernel that comes with 6.1, SU 6.1, doesn't actually shut down the machine. It just halts it. So that's probably a good idea to set that. Um, not sure about that one, possibly. So it could possibly cause a hang. I'll probably ignore that. Um, being the machine is going to be busy most of the time. Um, there's probably not a lot else to set there. Plug and play support, want that. Block devices, got a floppy disk, could be useful, possibly not. Enhanced IDE, MFM, RLL. So basically all the old stuff. Uh, so we want that. Um, include IDE, ATA2 disk support, CD-ROM support. Even if you had a tape drive or, or an IDE tape drive, you probably wouldn't need it. Uh, may, you might need a floppy drive. SCSI, if if you're using that, you might want to select that. These are drivers for specific chipsets, so you need to know which chipset you're using. I know I haven't got that, it's just a generic Intel PIIX3, so I'll take that off. Generic PCI IDEA chipset support, that'll do. Busmaster, DMA available. And there's some more chipsets there as well. So again, I don't need any of them. So I'll just take the defaults. You probably want loopback device support, um, network device. All right, if unsure, say no. So I'm not sure we need that. Um, and that's probably it for that one. Networking options. I just took the defaults for this, uh, which worked fine. SCSI support, I haven't got anything SCSI in this machine, so it's pretty pointless in enabling anything here. I'll just make sure that everything is disabled. Just take it all off. Otherwise, just building code that's unnecessarily going to be sitting around in memory doing nothing. Network device support. If you are connected over a network, you'll want that. Don't want ArcNet support. Dummy net driver could be useful. 
Ethernet 10 or 100 bits, so there's no gigabit stuff here. Not available in the kernel at the moment. Um, and then you need to select what type of Ethernet you want. So that's got to be selected to enable everything. What bus the Ethernet goes over. So Ether Express Pro. What driver is that? Pro 100. So it looks like there's a fairly generic Intel um, interface. That's not what I want. This option here, if you deselect that, you lose a lot. Um, so if you've got a nicer network card, you'll want to select that option to get those particular drivers up. In particular, if you've got an NE2000 card, which I've got, uh, don't select the wrong interface. It, it, the driver won't work. It's the wrong interface. The driver that I want for my one is PCI based. So I've got to make sure I've selected that option. And then you can see there's a separate PCI NE, NE2000 uh, support for that card and there could be other cards that are similar that have got um, the same chipset but different inf interface a uh, different bus so it's important to make sure you get the right one there haven't got that 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 no wireless no token ring no fiber no WAN and I don't know what that is amateur radio don't need that uh, infrared, don't need that. ISDN, don't need that. Old CD-ROM drivers. These are CD-ROM drives that had specific cards from them, so they weren't plugged into the IDE port. They had special hardware to drive, uh, normally called proprietary um, hardware, that drove um, the CD-ROM. Some of the stuff I remember from early to mid-90s was these, such as Metsushita, Panasonic and Creative. Um, there are others I do remember, such as the Aztec and Sony as well. Yeah, there they are. So if you know you've got one of these CD drives and one of the interface cards, you'll need to enable that to make sure your CD-ROM still works. So I'm going to disable that because I don't need it. Character devices. Just accept all the defaults here. Um, probably want real-time clock support. You don't want video for Linux. You probably don't want joystick support. And you probably don't want the floppy tape driver support either. File systems. Um, you'll probably, or you might want DOS FAT file system support could be useful. Um, these may be useful. So if they're in the kernel, they're ready to be used in case you do need them. Uh, these could be useful if you're going to use a CD-ROM that's been, uh, as suggested before, if you, you formatted the CD-ROM or written a CD-ROM rather with all the packages on, um, it may be written with the Microsoft Jolia CD-ROM extension, so it's worth having. Uh, you probably wouldn't need NTFS, but I tend to enable it anyway, uh, just in case you, you want to access an NTFS file system for some reason. Um, we definitely want second extended FS support. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessary. No, it doesn't look like it. Network file systems. You may want to enable, well, NFS is already uh, built in. Um, I'm not going to be installing anything to do with that. And likewise, not with Samba, but you may want to extend Linux from scratch 1.0. So there's probably no, not much harm in enabling them. Partitions types, don't need to change anything there. Native language support, you'll definitely want the 437 code page, which is kind of the default US. Uh, I'm in Europe, so I'll take the 850 code page as well. And then likewise, um, ISO 88591 character set as well. And that's that menu. Console drivers, um, you definitely want the VGA text. Uh, video mode selection support could be useful. It's a, an extra command I seem to remember that you can attach to the kernel boot up line if you did want to modify the resolution of the um, screen when it boots. Sound card, although we've got a sound card built into the machine, uh, it's not needed for what we're doing. And kernel hacking, there's only one option there. May as well enable it in case we need to get out of a sticky situation. And that's it. It's as simple as that, the kernel back 
back in 1999. So let's exit. We want to save that. And as it says there, the next thing we want to do is to run make dep, which is what it says in the book as well. So let's oops, run that. Okay, that's done. So now let's actually build the kernel with make bz image. And I'll time this and wait for that to complete.
Okay, so that's finished compiling after 10 minutes. And what we need to do now is to copy the BZ image file to the boot directory. So CP arch, and we've got I386 is the technology here. Boot BZ image to the boot directory. Just check we haven't got anything there. If you're unsure, you can do a FIFA verbose and an I for interactive, and it will ask if it uh, is about to overwrite the image uh, or overwrite the file rather. Um, and optionally rename the file. So that's probably a good idea to give us an indication of what the um, image is all about. So we can do move BZ image to LFS. Um, uh, let's call it one dash zero kernel. Let's put some underscores in there. I'm not sure if full stops will work. I guess they should do. Let's put dashes there. Okay, so we'll need that in a moment. Updating Lilo, and we need to change the image name to LFS kernel. So edit etc Lilo, oops, dot conf. And we now change our LFS image to use that kernel and instead of the SUS 6.1. Save it. Remember to run Lilo to update all its um, pointers, its index pointers. And the next thing it says to copy the source to the um, of the kernel to user source. So let's have a look at. Yeah, we've got to use the source directory. Is there anything in it? No. So we're going to move Linux directory to $LFS user source, and I'm going to call it Linux-2.2.13, just so we know what version it is, because just calling it Linux, we don't know anything about the what version it is. So let's just check that's there. And there it is. And there are all the files inside. So updating sim links. Often the user local include Linux directories as sim link to user source Linux. And user source Linux is often sim link to user source kernel version. Make sure the user source Linux now points to the directory of the kernel source you have unpacked before. It's possible that on your own on your system, user include Linux points to user source Linux. This depends on your distribution. Execute the following commands to create proper sim links on the LFS system. Now, when I did this, I found that the include directory that's mentioned there was actually a file, as I remember. So let's go into user and uh, do a long listing. Yeah, you can see it's a file at the moment. Not sure what's in there. Yeah, it looks like a bit of code, actually. So I'm not sure what that's doing there or where that's come from. Um, that looks like that might be from sysv in it, actually. So what I did was to rename that in case it was needed, or I didn't find anything that complained that in, uh, indicated it was necessary to keep it there, but never mind. To something like include dot back, and then I created a include directory, 
and then I was able to copy these commands to finish off these sim links. So let's copy that one in. Let's put a V in to see what it's doing. It's creating a sim link. So it's created a sim link from ASM to source Linux include ASM. Yep, so that ASM file or directory points to one that's inside the Linux directory. And looks like we do the same thing with um, a Linux directory as well. Yep, so if we looked at that directory there, we'd see Okay, looks like it doesn't really point anywhere. Ah, oh, right, okay, what's happened here is that it's because I've renamed the directory, the links don't actually reflect that. So what I need to do then is to include the version now this didn't seem to affect anything I did. Well, it might do. I might find that something worked that I found didn't work, possibly. So that won't work because it already exists. So we can put uh, an F here to force it. And we'll do the same with the... That was the Linux one. Let's do the same with the ASM one. Yep, so the file exists. Let's force that. And now if we look at these. Yep, that's better. It's actually there now. And the same with ASM. Yep. Okay, and these have actually changed colour to a directory. So that, that looks okay. So it is defaulted to an unversion directory, uh, that put that bit there. Please note that if you need to compile software, it's going to be used on your normal Linux system and it needs the kernel headers. It might be better idea to restore the sim links back to the original position if you decide not to load the kernel. Okay, so that's not going to be the case. That's okay. So the last thing we need to do here is to reboot the system again and ensure that this new kernel works. So I'll do that. I'll shut down this system here. Okay, so there's the Lilo boot. Let's type in LFS-1.0. And this is our own kernel loading now. Okay, so is there anything that is distinctive about it that will show that it's a different kernel? Yes, there is there, Linux version 2.2.13. So although it looks similar, the startup to the SUS Linux one, that shows for certain that um, our kernel that we've built is working and as before, you know, we can't do anything any different to what there was before. Um, but it proves that the new kernel we've built is working. And in any uh, future reboots we have to boot into the new Linux system, uh, we know that the kernel works correctly. I guess the only thing that's probably outstanding is to check that the networking works correctly. But we won't find it out until we've actually installed some... Um, network tools to actually connect to it and configure it. Uh, but for now, that's perfectly adequate uh, what we've created. So what we're going to do next is to, in the next video, carry on and start compiling some of the tools that will be needed to build the main Linux from scratch system.